Uh, okay, so my name is Johanna and I'm from uh, Western Finland and I'm 32 years old, uh, turning 33 this June, yes. And um, what else? Uh, I, Tell uh, us about your di your your illnesses. What are you advocating for? Yeah, this is actually a fun, <laughs> a fun story because you know this this morning we were reflecting with my my therapist and she mentioned like when we began. I just you know mentioned as a list all of the illnesses, but I didn't go go through it uh, any any further than that. So um, basically, I have. Uh, as the diagnosis, I have asthma, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, and um, epilepsy, then fibromyalgia, and um, it gets tricky because there are so many that I always forget one. <laughs> uh, yeah. But at least those four, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's difficult when you have so many like that because when someone's like, okay, what's your chronic illness? And then you're, you, you're like rolling out this long list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's and just kind of how it works. Yeah. And actually for doctor's appointments, actually I write them out and the same as with uh, like the medication, because otherwise I won't remember. And when, we, when I go to the pharmacy, I have to have a shopping list of, of the medication I will need because otherwise I will forget <laughs> Oh, yeah. I think a lot of us rely on list because it, it's so hard to remember, just especially too with brain fog. So I've been following you on Instagram and I did, I've seen that you do have some joint hypermobility. Is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome possibly something that you think that you might have as well? Uh, I've never really thought about it. And uh, IBD is then another like uh, hypermobility is something that uh, their rheumatologists mentioned as a sideline, just a you know footnote that I don't think they ever even put it as a diagnosis. And same same with um, IBD, because after I got the ankylosing spondylitis um, diagnosis, then a couple of years later I got so bad uh, stomach problems. Like, um, it was so horrible that literally my boyfriend couldn't stay in the same room with me because I, 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 I was so stinking, <laughs> literally. But uh, I went to a doctor and he told me that, you know, it's just a young woman's uh, stressed stomach. So <laughs> wow, that pisses me off. <laughs> yeah, and eventually, you know, I demanded a, col a colonoscopy, but my bowels were healthy, which is like even more puzzling because uh, if I have healthy bowels, then what's the problem? I honestly, I think you, I would bet money that you probably have Ehlers Danlos syndrome because that's just sort of how it works. Um, this is just a sidebar, but, uh, <laughs> that's sort of how it works. It's like when you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, it, it's a connective tissue disorder, which is, you know, your whole body, essentially most of your body. And that has a lot to do with the bowels. So, you know, my bowels are, are fairly healthy for the most part, but they don't work right. And that's part mm -hmm. of how it, it works. It's the nervous system is what kind of tells your bowels what to do and, and how to, um, respond and mm. when you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you have a dysfunctional nervous system, which is like mm. the blood pressure, the heart rate, the bowels, the temperature, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, getting a diagnosis is very important because that, that's basically uh, the closure for all of the questions that you have that, like, what's wrong with me? That's the, that's the worst part being ill when you don't have the diagnosis because then you don't have any idea what's wrong with you and that kind of um, that state will eat you alive a little bit because you're worried yeah. all the time and you feel like no one is helping and no one is is giving you any answers but then um, since I have have already so so many illnesses I kind of like had to even prioritize most of the time, like when I would see a doctor and they would ask my illnesses and I would list them and they would ask like, um, okay, so how do you treat your asthma? And I'm like, um, well, my ankylosing spondylitis uh, symptoms have been so much more worse that I haven't done anything to my asthma for years. So 
taking That's care so true. of yeah so taking care of oneself it's it's actually very difficult and this is something like i just have to mention like what my ex for example didn't understand he was healthy so he didn't understand when i was like i want to have the ibd diag- diagnosis or or something and he was like why do you want more diagnosis don't you have enough like what's wrong with you and then he uh, even stated that getting more diagnosis is just so that i can get more attention in instagram for like the specific uh, health days that we have like the world world health days and that's like exactly what the healthy people think that yes. we are just like i've get, heard that too Yeah, so that it's some kind of jewel on our our crown that we get more diagnosis. It's not that. It's because we need to have like answers and we need to have a name to whatever whatever is wrong with us. Yes, so so, we can manage it. Yes, because if you don't know what's wrong with you, you kind of feel feel helpless and then we of course circle back to the mental health health issues uh, which for example I didn't take into consideration for the longest time but you know we'll get back to, back to that <laughs> later <laughs> yes that's such a great point too and I absolutely feel the same way I know so many others do and you know I, I'm in biomedical science so I do a lot of research and you know with one of the studies was saying that a lot of these patients aren't getting diagnosed until it's too late and they're disabled now, their long term disabilities because they weren't properly managed and treated, you know, in their younger mm-hmm. years. And and that's yeah. that's why we need that. And, you know, from a personal personal standpoint, you know, I had the same thing that it was all in my head, that it was psychiatric, mm-hmm. um, you know, and with all of my heart issues as well, um, they they still would point to that. And so when I finally got a diagnosis at the age of 32 or 33, um, I can't remember, uh, that I finally had that validity so that when, um, whenever I would see a doctor, I could say, Hey, I have this. And then Mm -hmm. because I had that diagnosis, I was finally, it was like that ticket into care. Whereas before you get dismissed. And so it's so important to get that diagnosis so that you can see the specialist, you know, get that treated, get managed and, and so on. Mm. So I love that, that you bring that up. Yeah. And that's actually something that was um, very astonishing to me that actually it's because I, I used to think and we, we all live in some sort of like a smaller, a smaller bubble. And I used to think that it's only in Finland, like we, that, that the doctors that just happened to, on my way, they just simply sucked and, and didn't give me a diagnosis. And that's why it took eight years. But then, you know, after I found the Spoonie community in Instagram and I started to talking to people and it's the same everywhere. So no matter you're in Europe mm-hmm. or the States or Canada or Australia or wherever, when you have an autoimmune disorder, it's going to take um, eight to 10 years in general to get your diagnosis exactly because uh, the symptoms are mostly so so subtle uh, that you have to be progressed enough to get the diagnosis but then there is the other side of the coin that when it's more more progressed of course it's more difficult to uh, contain so it's very difficult yeah yes absolutely so 20 20 was a difficult year for many. Um, Can you share how your year has gone and how it's motivated you despite your lows? Yeah, this is very interesting question, actually, because um, the the first things that come to my mind have nothing to do with pandemic. Um, So I have to go a little little bit more back. So in uh, 2019 autumn, uh, we had a situation at my wor- workplace where the team of seven eventually became team of three and even my supervisor uh, left the company and left his job job basically to me because we didn't have any anyone else to do it. And I lasted four months until I just, you know, couldn't do it anymore. So in December, uh, like just before Christmas, I 
went on a sick leave for burnout. And um, it was basically the experience uh, put put me in a kind of kind of state that I had no self esteem left and. I felt completely worthless. And of course, on top of that, my immune system gave in. So I was in a flu for three weeks and that's how my uh, new year's went. So now we're at in beginning of 2020. So I had the flu and then the sick leave continued for two more months. So January and February, um, I, w- I was on sick leave and uh, we did have meetings uh, to think if I could go back, but there were no new hires. So the situation had not not changed at all. And uh, I had a mentor and she coached me and said that maybe you should apply to something else so that you can even have like a possibility of something else. And uh, then I applied and I got a new job. So in March, 2020, I started a new, new job and I was able to stay in the office for one week before the quarantine started. <laughs> so, oh. so basically in my new, new, new job role, I've never seen anybody because um, I've been working from home ever since. And um, yeah, then, this, the, then the pandemic really hit and basically that what took a very big toll on my mental health because I was scared out of my mind and eventually I developed very unhealthy coping mechanisms and uh, uh, reactions like every time I would uh, step out the door I would get scared and I would fear everyone like if people came too close to me on the street I would like go to the other side of the road etc and for two months I didn't leave the house at all so uh, my boyfriend went shopping for food for example and uh I stopped in my fitness team also. So basically I, I just gave up and uh, we then had some, some problems. Pandemic escalated uh, that. So during summer, we decided to uh, break up. We had been together for five years at the time. So of course wow. that was, <laughs> so of course that was very difficult. And I know this still that, you know, I refer to him a lot, but he was such a big part of my life uh, for, for a long time. So of course we have some mutual history. So that that's why he comes up still like um, many, many times, but well, in June we decided to break up and in July I found myself a new place. And in August we moved uh, separately. So that's be- pretty much how my summer went. Uh, buying new furniture because he owned everything and uh, uh, settling in to my new home. And uh, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, well, autumn started pretty good. Like I explained to you before we started. So I kind of had um, the attitude that I'm going to show to everyone that I'm better off like this. So I had the fighting spirit back. And also before even the breakup was finalized, I got in contact with my coach and said that, you know, I need to get back uh, to the team and uh, working out so that giving up is not an option anymore because I have to have some something uh, in my life which is going to keep me afloat, so to say, because otherwise you know, if I just am stuck in the sofa, it's not going to be very healthy. Mm, so we started off with a keto diet and I put all of my effort to the diet and to the workouts, etc. So autumn went very fast. But of course, then I started to become tired again. And um, uh, of course, the new job is pretty demanding. Uh, and uh, then we just ended ended the keto diet in November I think because it started to affect like I had more fatigue and uh, I was more tired and uh, things like this but my my bosses at this current job they're very supportive they might say in one-on-one meetings that you know okay that's that's fine about that job but how are your workouts 
So, <laughs> yeah, That's I know. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's so great, and I I feel so blessed at the moment because I stated in the in the interview that I want a place uh, where my personal growth is supported, and these might be the people that I could actually. Um, come out of the closet, so to say, and tell them about my ankylosing spondylitis, but I'm not there yet. And of course, it's a big risk because uh, people are prejudiced against like chronically ill. So I, for now, I will just keep it to, to myself. But that's like, that would be the dream that you get to be yourself, like with all, all of the aspects. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, mm, yeah, that was pretty much it. And for the autumn and the second wave, I, uh, instead of what happened to me during, during spring, because I, I totally lost it and I was, I was, I was so afraid and crying and I was sure that if I get COVID, I'm going to die. And all of these like horror images went through my head, but during autumn, I uh, used kind of my logical side and developed a method where I weigh the gains and the like pros and cons. Like if what you're going to do, if the risk is smaller than what you're going to gain, then it's worth doing. So for example, um, every time I go to the gym, even if I wear the mask, I'm, I'm the only one. So I might get, get the virus uh, through my eyes or, or something like this, but the gains is still bigger. So, I will get like motivation, mental health, and these kind of aspects. So that, uh, and then the rest of the time, I just try not to think about it. So I just concentrate on, on working from home. And of course, I'm a little bit career oriented since I'm by myself and all I do is work out and social media and, and, uh, <laughs> and work. So yeah, but that was basically my 2020. And uh, it was the most changes I've had. And I've had some, a lot of changes. But I think that was kind of like the turning point from also self-awareness point of view. And um, for now, I'm just trying to still find the balance, uh, how to recover from the burnout, how to not go overboard and push myself too much. And um, yeah, so so would yeah, that- would you say working out is um, does it help with your illnesses or does it mostly help just mentally or both? Both, um, because uh, w- one of your questions was what ankylosing spondylitis is like. So it's a progressive uh, chronic illness where actually eventually uh, there will be. Uh, like um, calcium buildup uh, in the spine spine joints. So if untreated, your spine could actually fuse together and in a like a curvature forward kind of mode and you will have limited mobility. So for example, um, during these five years that we were together, uh, I started I was when, when we met, I was uh, in the beginning of my uh, gym hobby so to say and um, he said that over the years my posture has been much better and even for example uh, we had a pre-Christmas dinner with a couple of co-workers and uh, one of them said that like do you always stand up so straight that is that normal? And I was like, well, uh, my hobby is fitness. And she was like, oh, thank God, because I was thinking that you're like normal person who stands up so straight because that raises the <laughs> bar for me. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, no, you don't have to. You can just scrouch like everyone else. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I all know. of the. Does that help you work on it, doing fitness? Because I need, I need that in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think it's a, it's especially the posing, and I meant to do a vi- more videos about that because you know, um, for example, uh, how can I describe this? Twisting your body, body like from side to side, 
uh, that's something that where I noticed that I have limited mobility and we take that into consideration so that I can like touch my toes and move forward with my spine what but uh, going from side to side that's limited and um, of course I think about it and it, it makes even logical sense that if your spine and your knees are or any joints if they are weakened um, you will have to have strength in your muscles or, or good muscles to keep the weak joints together so it's mm -hmm. it's going to be better and also one of my motivation is that um, I have heard kind of multiple accounts uh, on how ankylosing spondylitis uh, affects pregnancy so whenever the time comes there are like one of two options either it's going to go very well that the pregnancy hormones help with ankylosing spondylitis and I can be off medications um, all, all together. But the other option I think might be more likely that I'm bed bound for nine months. So um, and this is because then I would have to give up methotrexate and every time I've tried to come off it my knee starts to swell and then I would have to use crutches while pregnant and I can't oh, even wow. think <laughs> and I, I can't even think about that so so basically I will have su uh, such muscle strength and, and such amount of muscles that there is something to take off if I have to lay in bed for nine months so no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's important to try to have some type of fitness routine, especially with chronic illness, because you can get deconditioned. Um, and when you get deconditioned that I feel like, you know, that sedentary life, that's when you can have your illnesses increase. Mm. So, you know, what exercise or fitness might look like between each person is going to vary so much. So even if yes. it just means you're sitting in the chair and you're, you're doing like, you know, arm circles and, you know, yes. it's important to move your body. Yes. Each because, day. Yeah. Because for example, I've had uh, several coaches over the years now during my five, five years at the gym. And um, one coach had the philosophy that you know, you work out for six weeks and then you have one week completely off so that for one week you basically lay on the sofa. And during that time, I would start to hurt so bad and I would, I don't know how to describe it properly, but I would get anxious around my like back and my spine, like it, it hurt and felt uncomfortable. And so for now, for example, I don't have complete rest weeks. I have a light week weeks so that even those weeks which I um, take kind of off they are still I will still do something because mobility is good and any kind of movement is good it's the uh, like there are even researches about how, how sitting in the office for eight hours is bad for us so even after that sitting in your sofa and not doing anything like human body is not built for for, for this so that we should move but of course within the limitations and and boundaries of of our own bodies and and uh, that's that's why I think having a coach or personal trainer or something is so important because uh, they will have the professional insight uh, to the to the movement or the workouts itself and they can take into consideration your limitations like for example, for me, my left knee is so bad, and then, and uh, like the Im mobility in the spine, etc. Uh, when I changed to my current coach, uh, she actually said to me that uh, you should know that I'm going to treat you like every everyone else. That I've never had anyone with your illnesses, and I was like please. No one has ever had anyone like my illnesses. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, 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 you know, this is it's not like having this many illnesses, it's not normal. So, you know, don't worry. Let's just do this. And uh, maybe you, uh, the, the rest and the self-care and the sleep, those are st still things that I struggle because healthcare and self-care is not only about the gym and the workout, but it's 
it's actually about also the the rest and the mental health and and it it makes a complete picture so i'm still learning but i'm very strong advocate on 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 exercise yes and uh thinking about like if you would go and do kind of less meals workouts or uh, tennis or other kind of sports football etc you know there you have to do sudden moves to your knees for example or your ankles and these kind of sudden movements don't go very well with ankylosing spondylitis or arthritis but when you're at the gym you can take your time and you can find the posture and and uh, the setup and especially if you know you've been the program is done for you according to your limitations uh, the risk of hurting yourself is is pretty limited so that's that's why i also chose it for myself i have uh, tried over the years for example thigh boxing but even with the super big gloves my fingers would start to hurt and uh, then spinning uh, but yeah, it's not kind of my thing, but you should, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah you... it's like a trial and error. <laughs> like you, you got to try stuff. It might work for you, might not work for me. You know, like it's all going to be different based on the modifications that you need and, you know, like, and what you enjoy and, and for your, your body that works for your body as well. So. Yeah. Because, because exercise should be, should be motivating in itself. Of course, you won't be motivated all the time, uh, but it should be fun and uh, motivating and something that you, you enjoy. But of course, you know, there are days that I don't feel like going to the gym at all, but afterwards I feel invincible. <laughs> so it's totally worth it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So I read your story in lovewhatmatters.com and you perfectly painted a clear picture of chronic illness from the perspective of a child because you had a lot of illnesses as a child and these experiences that were very traumatic. And, and in that you said, I had no say over my own body. How did this affect you or how does this affect you as an adult? Uh, this is this is actually a very insightful question and it's something that um, I'm actually coping with or working through in, in therapy. And just this morning we went over this because I was uh, trying to prepare myself for, the, for this podcast and this question. <laughs> and, and so basically when I was, in what my earliest memories is having a chronic headache when I was three. And then um, even before elementary school, I had already had uh, sinuses surgery and tonsillectomy. So two, two surgeries when I was maybe seven or eight. And I remember um, staying at the uh, ICU or the um, hospital, hospital bed for... Um, when, when they were trying to find out what's wrong with me and they never did, that was actually the first time they, uh, my tumor markers were so high that they thought I might have rheumatoid arthritis. But since I didn't have the rheumatoid factor, which is one of the tests they run, they couldn't find anything eventually. But because, you know, either doctors told me what I should do or, or my parents told me what I should do. I eventually became, the term is learned helplessness. So basically you develop this kind of uh, sense that nothing you do can change what happens to you. So you don't have, you don't have the power to change what happens to you. And, and the first time um, I noticed it when I was uh, nine, 17 in, in high school that it occurred to me that I wasn't educating myself and performing and, and uh, getting good grades for my father, but I was doing it for myself. And I was 17 when that occurred to me that I'm doing something for myself. And then later on, when I uh, think about like the relationships that I have 
had like access, then I think it comes down to the problem that I had no self-respect and no self-awareness because I never got to know myself really until recently because of the burnout and 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 etc. So I didn't raise the bar very high and I had no idea who I was and what what I wanted because I kind of and I know this sounds crazy but you know I di- I wasn't living the life for myself I was I was just existing somehow and 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 no one ever explained yeah, I don't to think me that for- sounds <laughs> I don't think that sounds crazy. I think it's very relatable. I feel like many of us do just kind of go through the, with the flow and we don't, you know, it, it takes an epiphany to really kind of realize that you are just existing and not living. And that's such a a beautiful, amazing turning point to finally reach. Yeah. And uh, it, it, yeah, it, it took, took so many, so many years eventually because I, I have described it so that, for example, my t- ten years went past and I didn't know this. So when I was I when I was twenty, I started to develop the symptoms, so for ankylosing spondylitis. So five years went past when I was just you know uh, trying to get through university and focusing on on those goals and and everything external like outside of myself and then the next five years went when I was trying to get a permanent job because of course the uh, we had a recession and you know permanent job was very difficult to find uh, in technology industry where I work so I was just overachieving and and performing and driving myself forward which eventually led to back-to-back burnouts in three occurring years which eventually stopped me and led to therapy and I'm so much better off and even this morning my therapist said that uh, you have so much better self-awareness and self-empathy right now than since we started two and a half years ago so wow I love that yeah yeah and I'm I'm so proud of myself and I think that when Ever there is going to be next relationship for me. I'm much better suited because you know I actually know what I want or who I am, and I'm not just going to have have the only requirement is that someone likes me with my illnesses because that was like how low I thought about myself previously, and it's. Yeah. But at least I noticed it now on my thirties, and instead of like living for everyone else for the rest of my life and then you know at the end noticing that I didn't do it for myself so I love uh, that I've totally <laughs> relate I was the same way in all of my 20s I I had struggled with self-worth and you know I it was I was just like you so I think it's I think there's a lot of other people that feel the same way so mm. I think it's a great great subject to talk about for sure yeah, uh, it's it's so such so such a long story, but it definitely that that childhood and and growing up sick and for example, like the most most memories that I have because you know of course you forget a lot of, about the childhood memories that for example, and I I even remember them as fun most of the time like when I was in hospital being being poked and prodded you know, I didn't have to go to school and that was fun (laughs) or, (laughs) or, or like, um, for example, when, um, they were, uh, studying if I have epilepsy or not, and we would have to stay up all night, uh, for the EEG. So me and my mom, we would just, you know, rent out VHS and films and, you know, have chips and candy and we would just stay up all night. And I thought it was fun. And, even this this morning when I was thinking about this answer and I was like how did my mother cope with it because she has been working and then staying up all night with me taking me to like EEG and look at me sleeping with electrodes in my head and (sighs) yeah 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 I think about that sometimes too just you know, cause we oftentimes we, it's our life our perspective is through our eyes and, mm. you know, through our mind and our heart. And we don't, sometimes we forget about, you know, 
others and how how it all just kind of circles around yeah i actually asked her once um because i was i was curious and i asked her like how did you cope when i was such a sick child go- growing up and uh, she couldn't answer it was t- too too difficult i think she might be wow. traumatized traumatized as well uh, by by all it because I can't even think about the situation that when eventually I have my own children and when uh, he or she is three years old they are screaming like mom rip my head off because I want a new head because my head hurts so much of course you know that can't be easy and I'm the first child of three so uh, (laughs) it, it must not have been easy for her yeah wow So you're an amazing patient leader and advocate, and I love that you're sharing your story. What inspired you to start sharing your story? The pandemic. (laughs) 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 I mean, I'm, (laughs) yeah, I mean, that, that's like the short, short answer because, um, previously my Instagram account was, uh, Johanna Elizabeth fit and, uh, it was mostly about fitness. And then when the pandemic started, I realized that, um, especially um, because we had to to negotiate about mask use and we had such long conversations and he couldn't understand. So I realized that the chronic illness life is actually very high up on, on my list. Like when I think about who I am, Fitness is a hobby and workout is a hobby. And it's a mo- the mo- main motivator is to support me through the rest of my life. So for example, I'm not sure that I will like compete regularly or something. It might be something I want to do once in a lifetime. But what are important uh, is like the co- chronic illness advocacy and, and career at this point in my life since I don't have children of my own and I, I wanted to take the risk to be vulnerable and share my story and I knew that uh, my, my family and parents might not agree necessarily sharing so intimate details and I even eventually had the younger co-workers question me about this at work and then, of course, I blocked them in Instagram that if, you know, you have the audacity to question what I share about myself, uh, then, you know, you don't deserve to know. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And basically, the more I, and, and I, I changed my Instagram name to chronically Johanna. And uh, ever since then, I found so many wonderful people and, you know, I didn't even properly know like the Spoonie community then and what Spoonie means or everything else. And, uh, you know, even though at first I had more Finnish followers and they would prefer me to write in Finnish, but ever since university, I've felt more comfortable in an international environment. And I think it's mostly because then we are all different. You know, when I was uh, leading the Erasmus student network in my, my city, uh, where the exchange students come to the university, you know, when they're, they're Italians, Germans, Spanish, Uh, British like we're all mixed together then we're all different and I guess it's because I felt always different because I was always sick and I was I was different but I couldn't just you know point it out so I wanted my account to be international although I would still prefer or I would not prefer I wish I could advocate for the Finnish people but it's a little bit um Dangerous in a, se- in, in, in a sense that we are such a small community that if you advocate w- with your whole name, there might be a situation where, you know, you might not get help because you're advocating ag- against, you know, incorrect patient care or like things like this. So I'm trying to keep a low profile um, domestically, but, but then oh, advocating internationally and uh, uh 
every person who ever says, says to me, like, like, you're such an inspiration, like, con- will just cheer me on to do this, this more and be more, more vulnerable. And, and uh, for example, now when I talk about my illnesses, I don't judge myself. And this was also something that my therapist pointed out that, you know, I'm not ashamed of them anymore. I accept them. And this is, this is a major thing that, you know, it's just, you know, who I am. And I have been dealt this, this uh, set of cards and um, I have to make best, best out of it. And I think actually it has shaped me to be more persistent and uh, more ambitious and many kind of, m- many like good personality qualities, which I might not have if I hadn't struggled so much with chronic illness life. I love all that. I feel like you're my long lost sister. Like everything you're saying, I'm like, I feel the same way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I love I, it. It's, that's, what's, that's why I feel like we, sh- we do this because you find yes. so many people in your community. This, we have a community that, you know, it, we found because of mm-hmm. our chronic illness and people who accept us and who relate to us. And it's just really nice. Yeah. And, and, the the most amazing thing is that uh you know when you new, meet new people in instagram you you only have to say that uh i have a chronic illness and you uh what do you have i have the same and you have the entire basis there like the the other person will know when you say that i'm in pain what it means and you don't have mm-hmm. to explain anything more than that and uh, when you say that you're fatigued and we don't even have a f- word in Finnish for this, this is actually also something which I find that it's easier to talk about these things in, in a language which isn't my, my mother tongue, because it also creates a little bit of a distance to the story. So it's easier for me to express myself in, in foreign tongue than, than mother, mother tongue and, for example, medical trauma. Uh, we don't have this wow like like yeah i can translate it but it's not really a like wow. common com- common thing and and yeah so that's interesting yeah yeah but yeah i feel like with our you know with the chronic illness community like you were saying you know not that our healthy friends you know, are less than or, or less important. I mean, they're all amazing too, of course, but you know, it, there is a difference, you know, when I have my healthy friends who just don't understand and I tell them like, you know, I'm, I'm fatigued or I'm in pain, then, you know, it's for them. It's like, oh yeah, I got a little bit of a headache too (laughs) from last night. And I I get it. I'm totally with you. And it's like, no, you don't get it. But when you say that to someone, you know, like you and I having that conversation, it's like, oh, today, you know, I'm really fatigued. It's like, it, it means something else because we're fatigued every day. When we're saying we're fatigued, it's, it's something that if I feel like if any healthy person were in our body and felt that I, I always say they would fall to the ground. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we, uh, and we actually had a conversation, me and my ex uh, during, during spring, like, when when the word fatigue in Finnish, I, now I'm of course forgetting which it is, but you know there were um, news stories at the time, like how people who are working a lot with computers they get fatigued, and then mm-hmm. you know out of uh, out of that context, I was talking about my fatigue, like mm-hmm. the chronic illness one, and he confused it with the computer working people fatigue and then he said that you can't hide behind that word like when you forget when when you forget words and you become blurry so you can't hide hide behind that and I got so offended I mean seriously I was so furious like you can't dismiss one of my symptoms of my my chronic illness and say that you know I can't blame blame this like because I, I have it, especially in the evenings that I forget words and, you know, my sentences become not, not very understandable. And uh, most of the time, for example, um, it's 
I mix mix languages then that you know it's Finnish so Finnish and English <laughs> like <laughs> yes. mix mix together because of course I I use English in my work like all day even before this podcast we just had four hours of meeting in English but yeah that that that's the kind of conversations you might end up with healthy people so I've actually thought about it like the next boyfriend requirements will be something like if he's not ill then he has to have someone in the in the family or or in relations who has been ill so that he has some 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 kind of it's important yeah some kind of understanding what this is or then just uh, incredibly empathetic understanding and uh, thoughtful person Otherwise. Yeah, you don't want to be with someone who's questioning everything that you say and you want someone who's going to be supportive. Yeah. So I did want to ask, what is the healthcare system like in Finland? Okay, I did study this, <laughs> <laughs> the vocabulary <laughs> around this. Uh, so um, basically um, we have uh, the municipalities uh, in in Finland, which uh, are then uh, creating the primary health care and then specialized health care is centralized in, in, in hospitals. And then these form hospital districts uh, in, in Finland. Basically, the government has uh, created a system so that every person in Finland is, has social insurance and we are covered by the uh, like public, public health care system. And it's affordable and available. Of course, availability is debatable, but, but still. And then, of course, we have of, uh, the like private uh, healthcare. Many companies, for example, uh, employers often purchase then then the uh, work healthcare services from the private healthcare providers. And uh, on top of the public healthcare system, then of course, the uh, if we go up in the bureaucracy, uh, we have five uh, university hospitals around the biggest cities, cities in Finland. So, it has been quoted someplace that uh, Finnish healthcare system is one of the to- top of the world, but like I said before. Uh, getting diagnosed and and you still have to advocate for yourself so and in the past Finland has gotten uh, no I forget but it's from the EU uh, EU dash yes yes EU (laughs) EU dash healthcare.fi where I read this information and um yeah, but but from from EU, Finland has uh, gotten some notifications before, due to the fact that, for example, sometimes our wait lists for surgery are too long. Oh, so wow. so it is uh, stated now that it cannot be more than six months that you have to uh, wait for your surgery. But st- six months is still very long time. That is long. Yeah. And uh, what if it's like? In- emergent can they move it up or will they move it up or if yeah they... yeah th- yeah they will move it up but and for for example for my knee surgery uh, back in 2009 uh, it took six months because it oh, wasn't wow. yeah because it, it, it wasn't emergent but of course after I had waited four months to get to the rheumatologist be- mm. and it, it took like four referrals from both the uh, primary he- health care centers and also from from the private uh, doctors then I got to the rheumatologist and of course he didn't believe me because I didn't have enough showing up in the uh, blood test etc yeah yeah and then later on you know after multiple demands and you know he wrote in the uh, medical records that uh, patient is anxious and demands and kind of like these things that have nothing to do with the condition itself <laughs> or the symptoms and it's so unprofessional <laughs> but but eventually I got to an MRI and and they uh, t- took a picture of my knee and they said that they might be uh, meniscus rupture 
So wow. Something- so did you show it? Were you like in your face? <laughs> read that. <laughs> I I almost I almost did, and you know I, I I've talked about this a lot with some of the uh, chronic illness people in Instagram, like. I noticed that, for example, it would it's better if you go to the doctor with uh, no makeup and dirty hair and saggy pants, because then they are most more likely to believe that you are in pain because you look so bad, because you can't possibly be in pain if you have been able to take care of yourself and put on makeup and you look because exactly oh, yeah. that that but you don't look sick sentence. Yeah, absolutely. Which it's true. I mean, I always, I'm like, even if I don't wear li- any makeup, I'll put red lipstick on. I mean, now we got the mask, so it's like, you can't, it doesn't <laughs> matter, but you know, I always try to present myself, you know, to not look sick because of, it's for my own self-care and mental health. Like I, I want to feel good about myself. I, I don't want to feel, I don't want to look like my illness, you know, to me it, when I uh, even if I'm in horrible pain to put on some makeup, mm. that's just part of my own personal mental health and self-care. So speaking of mental health, um, it's such an important yet underrecognized foundation of wellness. Can you share your experience with anxiety, depression, and burnout just in, like in a nutshell? Cause I know that you're really passionate about that as well. Yeah. Um, so basically it came down to the, to the fact that when I started, had my symptoms the first time and the waiting and, and everything, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And it became uh, some of the medications they, they gave me, uh, put me to so, such bad nightmares that I couldn't sleep. So it, you know, stressed, stressed me out even more. And I was afraid and anxious and everything. So I kind of went on to a dissociative state because the reality was too much to bear like literally so what I did was that all through nights I would watch tv series heroes was my favorite at the time (laughs) and and I wouldn't live in this world I would exist but I wasn't here I was in the tv series so even even now I'm like uh, completely slave of television Um, but that, that was like the first first mental health care that I used as a coping mechanism, a dissociative state. And later on, I used denial because I didn't get the uh, diagnosis until eight years later. So I would just completely ignore my symptoms and I would completely ignore that I had any illnesses whatsoever. I was just a robot who put, you know, uh, medications to my bill box every week, but I didn't think about it at all. So for 10 years, I... I was in denial that I had nothing wrong with me. And since I didn't consider this and all of the limitations, what this new reality would put on me, I pushed myself like I was a normal person. And uh, this led to me burnout in 2017, 18 and 19. And the 19, 20, 20 period was like the one that, really really stopped me and um yeah just barely surviving and not thriving yes yes exactly and the first thing that we did because then then I like realized I can't uh I can't live like this or at least like if I want to have the future children even even if uh, I wouldn't treat myself this badly, they would. I, I mean, even, even if I didn't treat the, them like this, like demand and no boundaries, whatever, they would see how I treat myself, and they would like uh, imitate it. And yeah, they, they they would be the same. And I didn't want that, so I wanted to let's say fix myself. And. Uh, The first year in therapy went to accepting my illnesses and I figured out how to do that and I read all of the medical records from 10 years. Oh wow, I've done that. (laughs) Yes, yes. And it was so depressing, I even get emotional right now thinking about it because 
I, I didn't even remember half of the stuff because I had blocked them from my mind because it was so bad, like the, the denial and the dismissal. And, and I even once traveled to a specialist 400 kilometers with my crutches and my swollen knee just to show them that, you know, my symptoms are real because they didn't believe me. So, um, wow. Uh, so I cried for a couple of weeks and I became extremely depressed for a couple of months then. And of course, it was uh, hard on, on my boyfriend at the time because he, he couldn't understand. But afterwards, uh, this led to more self-awareness and self-acceptance. And, uh, and, uh, and you've yeah. discussed that you see a therapist um, has that helped you a lot too, just getting through that? And is that something you would recommend for others in our community? Yes, definitely. And I've even seen a couple of very good posts where, you know, if your rheumatologist with your diagnosis doesn't send you to a therapist, find a diff- different doctor. So the mental health as- aspect, like I said, like in Finnish, we don't have even the term medical trauma. Like it's completely dismissed. And uh, I should have known better and I, I should have uh, sought help uh, even earlier. Of course, during university studies, I have had seen like psychologists regarding the stress from uh, homework and, and master's thesis and things, uh, things like that. But it has nothing to do with medical trauma. Like when I was a child and uh, f- three nurses and a doctor and my mother, they held me down so that they could put a cannula in my arm. So I literally had no, no say over my, my own body. And these kind of experiences, you know, it's, it's good, good to talk them through with, with someone. And, you Absolutely. know, uh, mo- many of the chronic illness pe- people, especially the men still think that uh, it's like for the crazy people. And that's the general, um, <laughs> the general atmosphere still that, you know, going through a, therapist is something that uh, crazy people only need but then the society where we are living at the moment it's like less resources and more is demanded of you like in every every industry and everywhere you work even if you are self-employed that will become your reality if you want to support yourself so it's not it's not just about the chronic illnesses it's about the like society we live in now and how how much pressure is on on ourselves and uh, in Finland uh, government supports three years of therapy so for wow. example so for example the uh, amount I have to pay for seeing therapist four times per month is 70 euros so I just ordered food at home with the same same amount. So you know, if I cut cut a couple of snacks, I can get it get, get the same same amount, and it's totally worth it. And I'm even thinking that I will continue it with my own expense now that the three yeah. years is, is is over because I see it so beneficial. Absolutely. I I, I mean, even if you feel like you are you have wonderful mental health and you don't need to talk to someone. It's always good just to have that regardless. I feel like everyone should have a therapist personally, because, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we have to figure out how to work through problems. And I mean, that's, this is stuff they don't teach you in school. We just, we're trained to bottle things up, to put a smile on your face, suck (laughs) it up, you know, and, and that's, and that just builds up and builds up in, in us until we either just can't function or we, you know, have a breakdown. And I know for me personally, I struggled with depression and, and my mental health for most of my life. And it wasn't until I finally got a diagnosis just, you know, in the last couple of years that I was able to finally kind of come out and say, you know what? So I do have, you know, major depressive disorder mm. and PTSD and all these things that I never could talk about before because I was afraid to, because when you mentioned that to your physician, then that's what your problems are from. Yes. So it's exactly. like that. It's like, it's, it needs to be more, you know, welcomed and talked about and, and not, you know, blamed for our illnesses. And yes, I yeah, think it's pr- a, the, just not feeling safe, you know, to talk about it. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think the first first the first diagnosis I got was reactive arthritis and after that fibromyalgia and depression in that order. Like mm-hmm. you know the me- mental health aspect is there like of course you're going to become depressed when you know people don't believe you for years on end. So how else are right. you going to supposed to cope with that? Exactly. Uh, so let's lighten things up a bit. Tell me what inspires you. Um, other chronically illness people. Yes, I have. Oh, I have yes, that. that. Yeah, that's what imp- inspires me at the moment very much because, you know, um, I have found more people who who also work out, and then we we can share that passion, and. Uh, uh, you know, when they keep going, I get get motivation to push push myself the same, of course, within the boundaries. And uh, yeah, the the community is is giving me so much strength. Like even a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had not talked with this person quite a bit at all. And you know, just one morning, uh, she sent me a DM that I. I hope you have a nice day. And I was so like touched and I felt so good. And that one sentence, it, it literally made my day. And I was, I was so happy the rest of the, the day. And, and, you know, other people give me strength. Yeah, literally. I love Since, that. Yeah, be, because of course I'm by myself in my home uh, most of the time. And the only times I go out, especially regarding the uh, COVID covid setup are to grocery store and the gym and the rest of the time by myself but you know i haven't felt lonely like even after yeah even after uh, after the after the breakup uh, in august i have never felt lonely literally because i have always someone to talk to even to the point that my fingers hurt (laughs) because because i'm typing so much (laughs) yeah it's really important to find your community, you know, whether it's, um, through with chronic illness or grieving or whatever situation you might go through, there's always people out there that are going through the same and you got to find them. They're online, they're out there somewhere. Yes. Uh, So, so what words of wisdom would you share with anyone who's newly diagnosed with a chronic illness? Yeah, I actually found a newly diagnosed person a couple of days ago. She had her diagnosis last week, Wednesday. And, um, even like last year, this would have been a, a difficult question for me. But now the first advice is self-empathy. That uh, be empathetic to yourself because the di- getting the diagnosis, it's, it's a hard, hard hit. And the next, next thing is to try to accept it. And uh, maybe like, especially regarding the mental health and the boundaries and the new newfound limitations, the acceptance, which took me 10 years, is actually very important point so that, you know, you don't push yourself and acceptance, it's, it's very hard. And then the third is that it's not a death sentence. Yeah, because, because it's, it's possible to live with this and it's all about the attitude and during last autumn for example I uh, listened to Martin P. Seligman's uh, learned optimism so positive psychology and there are even studies like if you have positive uh, outlook instead of pessimism you can improve your quality of life and uh, pessimism and negative thoughts have been linked to like increased cardiovascular disease and even early death so I'm more determined than ever to you know never give up yeah. is kind of kind of the point yeah thank you Thank you so much. This is fun. I feel like I could talk to you forever. I know. I know. I have like so many hours of conversations with my friends. So when I pick up the phone, it never ends because, you know, there's so so much to talk about. I love it. We'll definitely have to have you come back on and, and pick a topic. And I feel like we could do so many of these. I love it. Well, thank you so much and everything. um, Why don't you real quick before we wrap up, share uh, like your website and how people can find you, which will also be included on the blog post and the episode notes. Uh, So my Instagram is chronically Johanna and uh, the same name is for my blog, uh, which is in Finnish. So chronically Johanna.com. 
but in the right hand lower corner I have included a Google Translate so you can pick whatever language you have and of course you know because Finnish is doesn't have the same grammar as English uh, it doesn't always translate very well but it does actually and I try to sometimes look it up and so that's my blog and I did join TikTok, but I'm not really sure. It's my scene, but the same name goes for there too. Ah, I'll find you. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out, but <laughs> I will add you. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Please be sure that you subscribe to the blog, which is bluedreamhealth.com, where you can find additional links and information on this episode. You can also check out the digital magazine on our website, as well as find us on Patreon, where you can be a supporter.